Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first bonus episode of HFES 2018. We are joined today by Sudhakar Rajulu. And uh, my name is Nick Rome. I'm joined also by Mr. Blake Arnstorff. Uh, so Sudhakar is a technical manager at NASA Johnson Space Center, and we're going to be talking about his Ergo X keynote that he gave today. Sudhakar, yes. I want to ask you, mm-hmm. um, what has kind of been your experience, or how did you get into the field of human factors and ergonomics? Oh, that goes back to my school days, you know, uh, when I was finishing my master's. In, actually, I was working on my master's in mechanical engineering, and I happened to run into uh, friends who were working in human factors, and I was completely interested in what they are up to and why, why they are studying that, because I never heard of that before. So lo and behold, I found that they were interested in studying humans and behavior and performance. And so I got into human factors program at uh, Ohio University and then went on to do my PhD at Ohio State University, uh, specializing in occupational ergonomics. And uh, so it all got started with, you know, it's kind of fascinating to see people are, in, at least in this country, are interested in manual material handling conditions and worker uh, safety and comfort and all those things. Coming from India, you know, you see all those manual work that done by people, and and it was fascinating to see that you know researchers are interested in minimizing their injuries, and so that was kind of fascinating for me, and that got me into the into ergonomics. And then, so from there, how did you get to NASA? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a jump there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody knows about NASA, you know, and but I did not know that uh, uh, there are things you could do at NASA in the field of ergonomics. And uh, I had a chance of either going to academia or, you know, go and work in industry. And I was more leaning towards industry because um, I just wanted to see more application rather than be more theoretical. And uh, so I was at a conference like this. You know, I've been going to conferences, you know, uh, while I was doing my PhD. And I ran into a person from Lockheed Martin and uh, came to find out that uh, they do anthropometry and biomechanics at NASA. And I was intrigued. I didn't know exactly what they were working on. All I knew about is that, you know, you see the space shuttle launch and you know, the spacewalks and, you know, and then unfortunately I saw the accident, the Challenger accident, I thought it was 1984 or something like that. So that got me interested, like, hey, I want to see what you guys do. So I got an interview, I went to the interview at, uh, in Houston, and I guess they... They liked you. (laughs) They liked me, so I said, yeah, I mean, I would like to work there, so... So I started in uh, 1990 working at NASA, but I was working with the Lockheed, not with NASA. So you were like a contractor? I was a contractor, yeah. So I joined the lab, uh, anthropometry and biomechanics facility, and uh, learned that they are actually more applied rather than theoretical, So, which is kind of interesting because that's what I was interested in. How do I apply what I learned? And uh, so it was cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners, could you just kind of describe what you do there today? 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 um, (laughs) uh, Well, I've been at NASA since 1990, except for two years I was, I had taken up uh, another job and left NASA, and I went back. So I became manager for the lab in 2000. Okay. And uh, so now, if you ask me, I work with the very talented people. And uh, it's, it's a, really a privilege and joy to allow youngsters to 
come up with ideas. And my job is to facilitate what ideas that we have that could apply, that we could apply to uh, issues that NASA has, okay? Um, NASA is a huge place, and what I'm saying is that it's my idea of what I think is NASA is needed, and NASA is a huge organization, you know, that's got propulsion uh, engineers and, you know, uh, technocrats and scientists in various fields. So what we do is that in the, within the realm of hardware that the crew members have to use, including the spacesuits, uh, we're interested in helping the engineers how to refine the design, you know, how to make the design more compatible with the, with the crew members. So when I give you an example, um, suits are pretty much designed based off of the flight suits, you know, the f fighter uh, sure, pilot yeah. uh, flight suits. Uh, and most of them are designed for male anatomy, you know. And when you try to adapt females, there are some changes you have to make. Right, they're, okay. they're not built the same. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and that's something also kind of followed into when we built the spacesuit for spacewalks. And uh, especially when, if you look at the male and female population, females are somewhat, you know, uh, s smaller, and that doesn't mean there are not tall sure, females. Sure. Uh, and they also have, anthropometrically, they have a different body shape, okay? Like hip area is different, and then the chest area is different. And then also, strength-wise, you know, they are not as strong as males are, okay? So when, you know, most females can get into a spacesuit, uh, but they are not, uh, you know, volumetrically, they're not as big enough to fill the suit in, which makes it that they have to work really hard to push the suit. And so, uh, strength-wise, it makes it difficult for a female. Not necessarily for all the females. Sure, right. So, our, so we, our goal is to make the compatibility better for all of them. You know, sometimes even males have problems with the suit, too, or they could get injured if... Um, uh, if they don't know how the suit is limiting them, okay? Because people think, oh, I can maneuver the suit right. and push the suit harder, and then you end up recruiting weaker muscles and end up with uh, contusions or s strain and, you know, uh, stresses. Yeah, because you made a really good point earlier about how the human body, we tend to really overcompensate when it comes to doing this kind of stuff. And so exactly. now we're using, now in space flight, it's a little bit different even. We're overcompensating almost doubly that. Yeah, exactly, because uh, <clears throat> spacesuits um, is a must for you to be protected from, you know, ra radiation and, you know, lack of pressure, you know, lack of oxygen and all those things. But it's a confined system, right? And so uh, it, the suit has to move the way our body moves. Without the suit, you can raise your arm really high up, right? Right. With the suit, you have to program it in a way that, you know, you, because of the bearing, the way it works. And if you don't train properly, uh, and you could injure yourself or put yourself in a compens compensation, right? And the other thing is that uh, people don't realize that uh, every time that you go on to a mission and you perform an EVA for, let's say you perform for one hour or something like that, you have to do 10 hours of training. So there's a lot of training happens underwater. So is that okay. 10 hours for every hour that you're up there? Up there, yeah. Okay. Up, when you're doing the spacewalks. When you're doing a spacewalk, sometimes it could be like five hours, six hours. Okay. So you can imagine they have to be very, very particular about what they have to do because right. they are floating in space and they are grabbing onto handrails and they have a foot restraints to hold them because you're floating, right? And you're also feeling weightlessness in microgravity because you are actually, it's a free fall. So even though gravity is there, right. but the way you're orbiting the Earth, you know, you are in a perpetual free fall, which means you don't feel the weight while you're moving. But whenever you stop or start, the inertia comes into play. So, but while you're doing the activities, you really have to, you know, manage yourself. How you going to access the the hardware and how you're going to repair them and then perform the things that you have to do, which requires 
lot of learning curve. And that's what they do uh, during e before every mission. They sp spend about several hours in the underwater uh, practicing what to do. While you're doing that, you still have the gravity acting on you underwater, right? Right, right. So, so it's a little different. Exactly. So now you're talking about cumulative trauma type because you're repeating the activities, right? And if you're overexerting yourself because you're still dealing with the gravity and you're doing things that are um, limited in terms of your capability because you're wearing the suit, it takes away some of your strength also. Right. You're working against a suit. So that training could, you know, affect you. And so the design of the suit is a critical aspect. How do we make it better and comfortable for the crew members? Sure. Yeah. So actually, something that you made a great point about in your keynote earlier was the work that you guys were doing to really mm -hmm. make the, the spectrum of the people that could actually fit into the suit a lot right. wider. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, exactly. So when, um, uh, you know, we, we have the NASA engineers can come up with solutions or products, you know, for to meet the needs of NASA, right? But unfortunately, you know, when you're talking about a hardware that the crew members has to use, we as a human factors folks have to provide what works and what doesn't work, okay? So from that perspective, when we realized that as we were working with the engineers that, hey, how come not many females don't have a suit or don't do EVA? And we found out that uh, they, we don't have a small suit for some of the females. The size is, you know. Right, so they just didn't have something, and that's didn't why they didn't something. do it. And the problem is that because when they dis, uh, commissioned the space suit program, uh, they did identify that we need many sizes. But d because of the budget considerations, they went with only building few sizes. But the components that go with the suit, which kind of like remains common across the suit sizes, were already established based off of medium and large suit sizes. Right. So when you want to go and look, build a small suit size, you couldn't put the control. That's what I was showing you. So, you know, so you make one decision and then you don't check across the board. Now you have to... You're stuck. Stuck with it. Right. So the only way you can you know, go and remedy it is that completely change the architecture, which is very, very difficult to do for a program like shuttle program because once you start the program, you, when you want to change something in a space program, it really oh, yeah. is, you're talking about monumental effort. Yeah, it's got that inertia behind it exactly. already. Exactly. And that's why when we started the Constellation program, which um, the, it was started like in 2004, is to go to the Mars, is as an opportunity for us to identify what do we need to do. So we were able to put in some criteria and then uh, recommendations how right. we should go about you know studying the suit sizes and who fits and who doesn't fit and how do we recommend to the engineers so we, we, we bear in mind we are not the designers right, right? right we are helping the designers so this is where ergonomists or the human factors person's role comes in very clear is that how critically we can provide the input to the engineers it's not like about criticizing them. Right, right. You're just it's about helping them and then we need to do our legwork to say, hey, this is very important and uh, can I help you in this one? Right. And when we do that, then they understand it. When I mean, the engineers can understand it, oh, this is why I need to study this you know, further and then make the changes based off of that. So are you informing requirements when you are sort of providing some of this uh, feedback about what the astronauts need in terms of anthropometric data? Exactly, yeah. So we, when I was working there in, from 1990 to 2000, I learned a lot by working with engineers, seeing that how they use the anthropometric data, how they use strength data, and notice that there are something that we could do better, okay? So one of the, one of the uh, insight was rather than using linear measurements, to define a person. We have to look at them volumetrically, the body's shape and size. And they did, we didn't provide that to the engineers. We just said, okay, here are the linear dimensions, like height, weight, and bite right. of breath and everything. 
But when you talk about a person getting into the suit, you're not looking at the issue with one dimension. You're looking at holistically how a person is getting into the suit. We went we went to acquire a system like a scanner and then said, oh, this is what we're dealing with. So that information was very helpful for the engineers. Okay, now I can use that. And then made sense to them too. Rather than harping on them like, well, why are you not meeting the requirement? Our requirement itself was missing something. Right. You know, so rather than just the linear measurement, we give the volumetric data, it actually helps the engineers to appreciate right. what they can do with it. It's always a careful balance, right? You don't want to step on anybody's toes, but you want to be information. You know, you want to provide information and be useful, right? Right, right. Um, so well, you, you see, it's like that's the thing. You know, like uh, if you're a human factors engineer, you need to understand what is it the the engineer or the designer is looking for, and then you have to see how you can tailor your information so that they can get the benefit out of it. Right. You can't just say, well, I have this information and I'm going to insist on you using it. Uh, well, they're going to use it no matter what, but I think if you're, you're not seeing the impact of it, you have to see, that's why I'm saying that you have to work very closely with engineers and then see how they can benefit from your expertise and knowledge. Right. Yeah. The explaining that ROI to people really helps I don't know, it helps anybody's case that's in human factors or ergonomics working cross-functionally because, I mean, without actually giving the why behind that kind of stuff, you can you can just seem like you are criticizing their work or you're not providing them enough information to go off of. Exactly. I, I think that's one of the <clears throat> things that, uh, you know, I learned is that it's easy to crit critique a design. Sure. Okay. But what is more relevant is that can you suggest how they can do it differently and then be able to demonstrate it, you know. I think that is a key part of, you know, being an ergonomist is how a working relationship with engineers, you know. Uh, you can't just say, well, you have to use human factors knowledge, but you have to understand what knowledge we are providing to them and then how they're going to use it. That's a good piece of advice. I know we're running up on time yeah. here. So mm -hmm. before we go, Blake, did you have any other last questions? Oh, no, I, I really don't have any extra ones. Um, so a lot of our listeners might be junior, uh, mm -hmm. just starting out in their careers. And um, I guess, do you have any sort of piece of advice for anyone looking to get into the field of ergonomics uh, that you wish you knew that when you first started? Oh, yeah. Well, first thing that, you know, I would try to insist on as I'm learning human factors is that how do people apply human factors knowledge with the engineers, because that is the very critical aspect of it. And doing an internship with an engineering firm and then working on hands on experience, gaining hands on experience, that would be very useful in terms of how I'm being useful as a human factors engineer. Without doing that, it's going to be a little hard to understand and appreciate uh, the information that one is gaining from the school environment. Yeah. Right. Um, so where can our listeners go and find you or any of your research if they want to find out more about this topic? Uh, there's the NASA website. And uh, do you want to mention that? Or? Yeah, I, okay. I can put the link in the show notes, but okay, it's the, please, yeah. the Johnson Space yeah, Center. You can actually the... go into anthropometry and biomechanics facility, and it'll bring up uh, the link to within the NASA public website. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Sudhakar, thank you so much oh, for, for stopping by and uh, talking with us about all this stuff. We really appreciate your time. And um, are you out of here now? Are you leaving? No. I'm are not. you sticking around for HFES? Yes. Yeah, right. All right. Well, we will see you around on the floor then. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Stay tuned for more of our coverage of HFES 2018. We'll be back for more soon. Until next time. It depends. <laughs> there it goes. Thank you.